I want to thank the organizers for this invitation. I'm honored to be here with such esteemed colleagues and faculty. I'm going to be talking about CLI and tubular artery interventions and key concepts. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel, Dr. Tamala's Vascular Channel, and follow me on Twitter at Srini Tamala. These are my disclosures. Obviously, if you're going to treat patients with critical limb ischemia, you're going to see patients like this on either a daily or a weekly basis. And everybody wants to try to achieve a three-vessel reconstruction or runoff like this. But to do this, you really have to start with the anatomy. Understanding the normal anatomy is very important. And also understand that there are tibial artery origin variations that occur as well. And this is very important when you're dealing with flush occlusions and CTO crossings and reconstructions and recanalizations. Other important tibial artery variants include the perineal artery continuous into the dorsalis pedis artery and the perineal artery continuous into the posterior tibial artery. And the tip-off here usually is a diffusely enlarged perineal artery with either absence or hypoplasia of the other tibial vessels. When it comes to angiography, I like to achieve anagrade CFA or proximal SFA access with ultrasound guidance. I usually place a six French sheath with its tip as distal as possible, ideally in the P2 uh, or P3 segment of the popliteal artery. I like a six French sheath because then it allows me to use an 014 and an 018 system if I'm performing either dual uh, tibial artery interventions or if I'm trying to do uh, pedal loop reconstruction. Obviously, once access is achieved, I give heparin, 60 to 70 international units per kilogram of body weight to really achieve a target ACT between 200 to 250 seconds. And you really want to perform high-quality angiograms, including AP and lateral views, as this allows optimal assessment of cap morphology, collaterals, distal targets, and really helps to determine access sites for CTO crossing and, and, and your overall treatment strategy. So here's an example of why sheath position is so important. Here's a CLI patient where I have anagrade access with a sheath in the common femoral artery. And you can see that although I can tell that there's a popliteal artery occlusion, it's tough to figure out what the proximal cap really looks like and the distal reconstitution point is really difficult to ascertain. Here's that same patient with my sheath now more distally in the P2 segment of the popliteal artery. It really gives me a good idea of that proximal cap and tells me that there are large collaterals arising from it. This is going to be a difficult and anti-grade recanalization, and I'm pro I may be better suited with uh, retrograde or dual access in this case. And now you can see the reconstitution point well, and you can see a nice thin channel there. And so as a result, my retrograde access allowed me to achieve recanalization in this case in really less than 10 seconds. So much quicker, easier recanalization as a result of the angiogram. So when you're dealing with baloney disease, there's some common features. You're going to be dealing with CTOs, heavy calcification oftentimes, and even more so in patients with diabetes and CKD. And there's some histologic work showing cells of cartilage and bone in these CTOs, which can make crossing them difficult or sometimes impossible. And you really have few bailout options when you have complications such as dissection and perforations. The TAC endovascular system was recently approved by the FDA, and so that may help with dissections. And the Saval trial, which is really studying a dedicated tibial drug-eluting stent, uh, may be useful in the future as well. If you've never seen a CTO under a cross-section, this is what it looks like. And all the black arrows are really pointing to small microchannels. And so when people talk about guide wire escalation, 014, 018, 035, this is what they're talking about. You're starting small, trying to access these microchannels to perform your recanalization, and you escalate from there based on how your CTO uh, crossing is progressing. Next, let's talk about cap morphology or CTO cap types. This is a nice paper by Mustafa and his team where they really analyze various uh, CTOs and really described four main patterns of CTO cap morphology. And what you can see here is that when you're dealing with a type 1, you know that your catheter and guide wire are going to start intraluminal when you start your recanalization, but where you end up depends on how successful you are. If you look at type 3 and 4, your catheter and guide wire are most likely going to hit the apex of that CTO cap, slide off to the side, and you're going to begin a subintimal recanalization. And so then you're going to need catheters or various guide wires or even uh, reentry devices to achieve intraluminal access more distally. The concept of hibernating versus the non-hibernating lumen or vessels is also very important. Typically, when you have a CTO, you have a proximal and distal cap. And if the channel in between is open but angiographically occult, that's called a hibernating lumen. 
If it's occluded from proximal to distal, then you have no hibernating lumen, and that's a much tougher recanalization. Let's look at a couple examples. Here's a patient with CLI. They have a wound on the bottom of their foot. They've got a distal posterior tubal artery occlusion. I don't know whether there's a hibernating or a non-hibernating vessel here or hibernating lumen until I do my recanalization. And then now you can see that the lateral plantar artery was a hibernating vessel, and there's nice angiographic wound blush as well. What about the case of a non-hibernating lumen? This is a CLI patient with diabetes and CKD, and I basically had to fight my way through this occlusion from start to finish. And the reason for that is because extravascular ultrasound showed that there was really no patent lumen or channel. And so this is a, an example of a non-hibernating lumen. Another important concept is direct versus indirect revascularization. With direct revascularization, you're opening up a blood vessel or an artery that directly supplies the abnormality involving the foot. On the other hand, indirect revascularization is you're opening up a blood vessel that gives collateral flow that then supplies the area in question. So let's look at a couple of examples. Here's a patient with CLI and chronic ischemic changes, sites of gangrene and ulceration and dependent rubor. And in this case, I opened up the anterior tibial artery and did a pedal loop reconstruction and was able to achieve direct revascularization uh, successfully in this case. Here's another patient with CLI who has diabetes and CKD. I was unable to open up the patient's anterior tibial and posterior tibial arteries due to extensive calcification, but I was able to open up the TP trunk and the perineal artery. And you can see that there's robust collateral flow from this perineal artery supplying the anterior and posterior circulation of the foot. And in this case, I was able to achieve an indirect revascularization and heal the wound dehiscence involving the TMA. Another important concept is guide wire tip load. People will always talk about 4 gram, 12 gram, 30 gram tip loads, etc. Guide wire tip load is the minimum grams of pressure needed to deflect or buckle the distal one centimeter of a guide wire two millimeters. So what does that look like in real time? Here's a CTO of the anterior tibial artery. You can see videos of low, medium, and high tip load guide wires from left to right. And when you look at the low tip load guide wire on the far left, you can see there's a lot more bending and prolapse of that distal tip compared to the far right with a high tip load guide wire where it's almost non-existent. Finally, here's a study that shows you the importance of intravascular ultrasound and extravascular ultrasound in terms of choosing the appropriate size balloon for tibial interventions. This is a study out of Switzerland where they did an angiogram, fixed the tibial artery, and then repeated the angiogram 15 minutes later. And in 97% of the patients, they had a mean luminal compromise of 29%. So a third of the lumen was gone within 15 minutes. So undersizing balloons can really affect your perfusion pressure and flow when you're treating CLI patients. So in conclusion, become an expert of baloney anatomy, perform high quality angiograms with catheters or a sheath as distal as possible, assess the cap morphology, collaterals, and distal targets to determine access sites for treatment. Remember, perfusion is unpredictable, so determine direct versus indirect revascularization. Optimize balloon sizing using IVIS or EVIS to improve luminal gain. Know your limitations and always ask for help. Thank you.